right, I'll give it a try. No. Try not. Do. Or do not. There is no try. Okay, we got an exam coming up on Friday. I know a lot of you are ready for spring break and you want to get it done and feel good about your work and put some points in the bank. I think this exam is a great opportunity if you're working hard, I know many of you are, to show me what you can do and show me that you can master this and do really well, and I hope you do. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump in. First thing I want to say though is some of you are asking about test taping, taking strategies and one of the best ones I can give you is you know, if you get the first exam on the ex our first uh, problem on the exam and it looks kind of challenging, you're not sure, just flip through the exam. I'm sure there'll be something that you can find that you studied and you can just knock out and, and be confident on and solve it and be happy. And, and that's a great way to start an exam. You want to start with confidence building, right? So if you can find a problem that you can just tee off on and just knock it out, that might give you insight for another problem and then move your way through the exam and solve the problems you know and maybe leave the ones you're less certain uh, in terms of solving um, you know, solving um, approaches, leave those towards the end. Now granted you don't want to totally not do anything with them, but I, I highly recommend doing it in the order that builds your confidence and helps you feel better about what you're doing. So I used to do that because I used to get a little bit nervous about test taking and so if I found one that was difficult I'd move on and, and come back to it. So hopefully that helps some of you. But Look at this first problem here. So this is one that I hope is is very uh, familiar to you at this point, this idea of the, calculating the pH for a buffer, right? That's that's something we've done quite a bit here. We've done it both on its own and within the context of acid-base titrations. And here you're given a buffer with 150 millimoles of acetic acid. And you know it doesn't matter what you're given here. I could have given you molarity. I could have given you moles. It doesn't matter. Um, you know you can figure this out. So there are 50, 150 millimoles of acetic acid. I don't like writing acetic acid out every time. I think there are better ways to spend your time on an exam. So I will just call this HA. You could call it whatever. You could call it H Bob, H Rick, whatever you want to call it. I don't care. HA is a great way to save some time. I'm also given 150 millimoles of the sodium acetate, which if you realize here, number one, don't be distracted by the spectator ions, but acetate, right, is an anion and that is simply the conjugate base of acetic acid and we can call that a minus or whatever you want to call it I don't care you can be creative and then we realize that the total volume is a half a liter uh, you know since we got millimoles I'm just gonna go ahead and get rid of that and say I'm not gonna be distracted I'm just gonna call that 500 milliliters because millimoles over milliliters gives you molarity and that's really important now, you're also given a Ka, which tells you a couple things. Number one, it tells you that this is a weak acid, and that's really important. The other thing it tells you is maybe how you, th you think about the chemistry here, because that's what you really have to zero in on when you're given one of these word problems, is what chemistry is going on. Well, in this case, um, you know, we've got the weak acid here and the conjugate base. We could write an equation with either of those, and that's fine, because they're vo uh, both in the solution. Oh, wait a minute, they're both in the solution equal amounts. Some of you probably know right away how to solve this problem, and that's great. But for those that don't see that, that shortcut, let's, let's think about this. Well, if I'm given a Ka and a weak acid, well, I can go ahead and write that chemistry right away. So let's go ahead and do that. HA, right, is the, the weak acid, and that's an aqueous solution, which means it's going to react with all the water that's around. Plenty of water, right? And since it's a K value that's kind of small, that's equilibrium, right? It's definitely not a one-way reaction. And that's going to give us your conjugate base, which is really important. And it, since it's a Ka, we better get some hydronium. And that's critical. So the second reason I might write the chemistry right like this is um, I don't have to find a Kb, right? If I write it with the conjugate base chemistry, I've got to find the Kb because I'm going to be producing hydroxide. And the other thing, I'm looking for pH. So if I'm looking for pH and I can find hydronium, I'm off to the races and it's really easy to solve. So there's a couple of reasons to think about the chemistry kind of based on the Ka you're given. It might be helpful, especially if you've got both in solution and it doesn't matter which one you solve for. So the next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and solve my ice problem because I've got an equilibrium set up here and I'm going to try to remember that these are for molar concentrations, right? Ice is for concentration, really important. And I started out with what? I started out for the acid, I started out with 150 divided by uh, millimoles divided by 500 milliliters and if I do that math correctly I hope I get 0.3 right I'm gonna go ahead and put my units there water don't care it doesn't factor into the equilibrium the conjugate base well I gotta also have 150 millimoles same volume look at that 
some of you are just already saying this is an easy problem I can tear this up and that's great and then I've got zero hydronium there was none added here no, no extra hydronium so we know it has to shift over to the right because there's zero hydronium so I'm gonna go minus X plus X plus X there you go pretty easy 0 0.300 minus X 0 0.300 0 0 plus X and that's because the stoichiometry is 1 to 1 0 plus X is X good <clears throat> I apologize my voice is kinda going out I think I'm getting some allergies which is no big deal okay bear with me there um, so we got 0.3 minus X 0.3 plus X 0 plus X we're all set up that's great so now we can solve for X we can use the Ka I typically like to write out the chemical species involved and these are at equilibrium concentrations right whenever you write a K that is at equilibrium I know it has the same algebraic form as Q but Q is at any other condition right whereas K is at only equilibrium and that's really important so I write that out and then um, let's see what do we got here let's go ahead and throw the numbers in there now from our wonderful ice table ice tables are so awesome because they help us avoid mistakes there we go 0 0.300 minus X and since uh, K is kind of small we can probably make our little assumption here that X is small compared to 0.3 and then we can write it out like that the point threes cancel leaving you as X is equal to 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5 and you can say here that negative 5 compared to uh, point 0.3 uh, is pretty darn small so you're okay nice thing about this if you think about it X right is the hydronium concentration it's always important to remember what X is, right? That's really critical. And if you think about it, that equals Ka, which is wonderful because now all of you guys that saw the shortcut, for this case, pH can equal pKa because we start out with a one-to-one -one mix of weak acid and conjugate uh, base, which is really cool. So you could solve it by, you know, negative log of this number and that's fine but if you saw that little shortcut that might have saved you a little bit of time although oftentimes I'm gonna make you write the ice setup which is really important so in this case pH I think if I did my algebra correctly equals 4.74 really really simple problem great way to set this up I really enjoy this problem okay now we took that wonderful buffer that we had and some idiot threw some nitric acid in there and that's that's really annoying uh, for a lot of reasons but number one is we're gonna see what what happens here and, and solve this problem so we were at equilibrium now somebody threw in some strong acid right nitric acid is a strong acid and whenever you see a strong acid I just kinda put an X over there and I say I'm not gonna get distracted by the spectator ions I'm just gonna treat that as hydronium because that's what you get okay so let's think about the chemistry here you've got a buffer and buffers are amazing because they resist large changes in pH because you have both the weak acid and its conjugate base that means if we throw in some strong base it's going to react with that weak acid and in this case if we throw in some strong acid it's going to react with that weak base and so let's zero in on that chemistry right we're going to have conjugate base right in an aqueous solution plus our strong acid from the nitric acid that we dumped in that's really important and for neutralization which is what this is a weak base with a strong acid they really can't exist in solution together they're gonna to react they're gonna neutralize K value is really large so I'm gonna go ahead and write it effectively as a one-way uh, reaction and you're gonna get some of that weak acid in this case this is our our base and our conjugate acid right and what else do you get well you get water right it's neutralization you know that from chemistry 111 and so effectively what we have here is a limiting reagent problem and for limiting reagent problems we deal with stoichiometry <clears throat> and so we have our initial our change and our final number of moles in this case you can say moles or you can say millimoles I like millimoles for the reasons I've talked about in class they're much easier for me to deal with and to, con to be able to um, conceptualize in my head so I, I like those numbers so what do we have here we we have our, our uh, buffer and what do we have up and above uh, in part A it tells you there's 150 of each well that's easy enough we have 150 millimoles how much of the um, acid did we dump in well 
we dumped in 25 mils of 0.2. If I can do my arithmetic today, that's about 5 millimoles, right? How much of the weak acid did we have? Well, problem above tells us 150 millimoles. And water we don't really worry about in this case. So which one's our limiting reagent? Well, in this case, our strong acid is our limiting reagent, so it will run out first. So it's going to decrease until it runs out. And by our 1 to 1 to 1 stoichiometry, that means our products will increase. And again, we don't care about water. So hopefully I can do some arithmetic here. 150 minus 5 is 145, right? And I'm going to go ahead and write my units because they are very helpful. Our acid is all used up. It's all converted, right? And here we get 150 plus 5 is 155 millimoles. Great. So you might be tempted to jump right into the ice problem, which you'll see in a minute. But I'm worried that we need to think about what's going on here. We had, what? 500 milliliters to begin with and so some, some idiot dumped in the acid which gave us a 25 additional milliliters so that equals 525 milliliters of total volume and that's really important because if you don't have that total volume there's no way you're going to convert out from millimoles so I write that down 525 we don't worry about the hydro uh, hydronium it's used up and so we have 525. So that will allow us to calculate our new concentrations. So now what, we, what do we have here? We've got some um, decreased conjugate base that was reacted with the strong acid and we generated some more of the weak acid. So again, we still have a buffer. And so we just changed the ratio ever so slightly. That's a, the amazing thing about buffers. So now we need to go back and kind of redo the problem up here in part A and think about the chemistry and what reaction might you write? Well, you can easily write the reaction for the conjugate base, if that's what you like. However, you're going to have to find Kb, which is kind of annoying, and you have to find pOH and subtract it from 14, and, and nobody has time for that. So I'm going to go ahead and write the chemistry focusing on the acid, just because I'm given Ka, for all the same reasons I, I discussed above. So I'm going to write HA, uh, reacting with water again. Now, be careful and, and show me what you know. This is, again, equilibrium because you have a K value that's pretty small. So this is going to be a, back, a reversible reaction. So um, you need to show me that. And we're going to get our conjugate base again. And since this is Ka, some nice hydronium, right? And that's really important to write all that out. And so here we can now write our ice setup, right? No problem there. And again, I'm going to remind you with the brackets that we're dealing with molar concentrations, not number of millimoles. And so what do we need? We need to know the, the concentration. And so we can just take 155 uh, here, right? Because this is going to be the um, weak acid. And so 155 divided by 525 is going to give me something on the order of 0 0.295 molar. We don't worry about water. And then we've got the conjugate base and solution. There we go. And that concentration is 2.276 molar. And we don't have any hydronium because it was all used up. So we're reestablishing equilibrium. And that's really important to think about it that way. So we're going to go uh, minus x here, plus x here, because we have to generate at least a little bit of hydronium. Reestablish that equilibrium. And so very simple. Uh, 0.295 minus x, uh, 0.276. Oh, my pen's getting kind of weird there. Sorry about the, there you go. Kind of hard to see that. And then x. And we solve it effectively the same way we did way up above. I'm going to bore you and write the actual expression because I think that is really important to understand what is going on. It's also a great way to get some partial credit if you uh, blow the mathematics. Um, I want to be careful not even call it mathematics, it's arithmetic, it's really simple. Okay, so we got that, and now we plug in our, our numbers, 0 0.276 plus x uh, times x, and then uh, over here it's 0 0.295 minus x. Now here again our k is small, so we can make the approximation that 0. Uh, 276 compared to x is pretty big, or rather x is small compared to that value. So we can just put this in like this, 0 0.295 is big compared to x, or x is small compared to that, and that equals our 
are 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5. And now you just really plug it in, uh, solve the ratio. I think I ended up getting, what did I get here? I got x equals, and again, I will bore you again by writing the hydronium concentrations, what x actually is, because you need to remember what x is. And I get uh, roughly about 1.92 times 10, what is this, to the, the negative fifth, I think. Yeah, probably so, that's a molarity. Uh, your pH then can be determined directly from that, which gives you a pH of, wow, and this is something to think about, right? We added some strong acid. That means the pH should go up or down. Well, if you're adding acid, the pH should go down. So in this case, when I calculate it, I think I get 4.72. Wow, look at that. I went from 7.4 to 7.2. And that, uh, if nothing else, really shows you the wonderful ability of a buffer to resist large changes in pH because, well, I don't need to tell you because we'll solve the problems below to demonstrate it and show you some numbers. I'll show you the science, right? So here we can say, all right, well, what was the pH change between part uh, A and B, right? Well, it was modest. And in fact, if we sit there and say, okay, well, 4.74 minus 4.72, um, there we go. I think I get a whopping, it went down, uh, right, by 0 0.02. So that is small right and that's the amazing thing buff buffers do is that they resist large changes in pH because well, well we'll get to that in a minute what is the pH of half a liter of dehy water well many of you could just sit there and write 7.00 and why is that well it's based on kw right you remember that by kw the concentration of h3o plus right i'm not going to say equals it's a consequence of uh, that equals 1.0 times 10 to the negative seven, right? Because the Kw is what? That's equal to the concentration of H3O plus times the concentration of hydroxide. And you know that's equal to one times 10 to the negative 14. So, you know, probably overkill. DI water, neutral, 7.00. There you go. Now, here's the fun one. What if we threw that same amount of strong acid? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna write that as H3O plus to avoid any problems into just instead of the buffer like we did above just half a liter of water well in that case we can do it pretty simply we can say we have five right millimoles of hydronium there's really no reaction here so we can just go into our total volume which is 525 right and I think that gives me something along the lines hopefully I, I wrote this down right 0 0.0952 molar hydronium, right, because basically we just diluted it, um, and now we can say negative log of that, and I get something on the order of, what did I get? Um, I got something along the lines of, what, 2.02. .02. Wow, that is a big change in pH, and hopefully I did that math right. You can check me if I, I didn't. It doesn't matter. It's pretty simple to solve that, and so now if you look at this, right, you say, okay, I went from 4.7 Four down to 2.02 .02. and I should have actually done final minus initial but it doesn't really matter here we're just looking for a change we went down and that value I think I can figure that out pretty simple right it's 4.74 minus 2.02 .02. and there we go look at that two whole pH units and some change right so I would say that's a rather large right that's a rather large change in pH so what does that tell you? It tells you that water is a crap buffer. In fact, it's not a buffer, right? It doesn't buffer against any change in pH. That's just DI water. So crazy, huh? So what is a buffer then? Well, buffer, I'm, I'm not even going to write it down. I'll just tell you. I mean, really, it, it resists large changes in pH. I better write it down in case someone's listening or not got tired of my crappy voice and just wants to uh, watch it. So resist uh, large change in pH and how is that well it's quite brilliant it works by reacting away react with um, weak acid or 
weak base, right? And in the acetic acid buffer we just talked about, if you have a strong acid, it's going to react with the conjugate base, acetate. If you dumped in some base, it would react with the acetic acid, the weak acid. And you have very small amounts because all you're doing is really shuttling um, back and forth, right, upon the addition. And so you're changing the ratio of these. And as long as you don't break the buffer, that is, react all of one of these or the other, you're in good shape. And so it's really quite quite amazing. Buffers are just so central to the fact that we can survive as organisms. It's important to the environment, to the soil, to growing crops, to feeding the world's population, you know, um, all kinds of things. I mean, buffers are just amazing. If you think about uh, blood chemistry, all kinds of just, uh, it, you know, I wish we could do a whole couple weeks on buffers, but we just don't have that time. So anyway, I hope that's good for you, and that's our first page. Uh, sorry we're running a little bit long, but this is something that I think is really important. So if you want to, you can just skip along if this is the easiest part for you. Next question here, moving right along. It says, which acid here is stronger? We have chlorous acid, acid or hypochlorous acid. And this is really a simple one, right? Because all you got to do is look at the Ka. In this case, Ka is 10 to negative 2, 10 to negative 5th. That means that H... ClO2 is strongest or stronger since there were two, right? So that's the easy part. You're just looking at the K. Bigger Ka's, right? Bigger K's normally face favored products more. And so if this one favors products, it's going to generate more hydronium, and that's the stronger acid. And so remember, we talked about this idea. And I'm not going to draw the whole Lewis structure here because I don't want to belabor the point, but. Remember, we, we talked about uh, these oxy acids, right? Here we have uh, the chloride, a chloro rather, in the middle of two of these. And then in this case, we've got a chloro and one oxygen. We talked about this idea of more oxygens, right? So more oxygens increase acid strength for these oxo acids, right? And that's really important to remember. And so why is this, right? Well, we can treat, you know, if you think about it, right, you're going to have this group and this group, right, and this is kind of goofy, but uh, we're going to have our oxygen. Um, I'm not going to draw a little structure because I told you we don't have time to do all that. Uh, but basically, you've got this big thing attached to a hydrogen. And this is our um, hydrogen that's going to be polarized with pus. And then this big group here, I'm going to say, is polarized with negative, right? And so the more oxygens that we have, the more electron density, the more electronegative this group is, the more it's going to polarize, which means makes this kind of more proton-like in a way. It's making it partially positive, which makes this bond weaker. And if this bond is weaker, it's easier to break. And if it's easier to break, it's a stronger acid. And that's really important. So if you compare that to um, the hypochlorous acid, there's only one oxygen and only one oxygen doesn't give you as much polarity difference. And so that dipole is really important. The more electron density you shield or you pull away from that hydrogen, the weaker this bond becomes and the easier it is to pop off. And if it pops off more easily, it becomes a stronger acid. So it's in your textbook. It's in your notes. Make sure you go read that if you're a little bit confused. But I think it's, it's pretty straightforward. And again, you don't have to you know, draw your Lewis structures from 111 here, but I think it's a skill worth worth revisiting if you can't. So here we have another one. Uh, will an aqueous solution of sodium chloride uh, be acidic, basic, or neutral? And this is a wonderful question because if you look at this, you should be yelling, uh, oh, okay, I have um, sodium chloride, which means that is another term for a salt, which is really important, or an example of a salt, rather. And so really simple, two reactions, and you can solve this. First one's so trivial. This is a soluble salt, so I will write it like this. It is a soluble salt. We talked about what we kind of, we say what 0.1 molar is kind of our, our breaking point. If it's soluble greater than 0.1 molar, then it will be a, considered a, a very soluble salt, and it will give us our sodium uh, cations plus our uh, chlorite anion, which is really important here. Okay. We've talked previously that sodium has no appreciable acid-base chemistry, right? No acid-base chemistry that impacts pH. So it deals with this guy now. So we can take this one and bring it down, and we can say, okay, well, this one 
is aqueous, right? And if we think about that reacting with water, what's going to happen? Well, let's say you didn't know. Well, this one, does it have any uh, protons or hydrogens it can donate? No, it does not. However, it's an anion, and I bet would like a proton back. And so we can sit here and say, this looks like a, a conjugate base to some weak acid. And sure enough, it is. There we go. We talked about it in the previous example. You've got this one. And what else do you get? Because if you just look at that, you might say, oh, it's an acid. Game over. No, 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 no. Be careful. Be careful. Here we've got to realize that if this guy takes a hydrogen from water or a proton from water, what is left? And what is left is really quite critical. It's hydroxide, right? And why is that? Well, if this is a weak base, right, then this is going to be its conjugate acid. And then water was our, our, our weak acid here. And this is our conjugate base. And so what dominates the pH here? If you had, you know, I was yelling at you, what circle one, circle one, what's going to, what's going to dominate the pH? Well, it's hydroxide. And if that's the case, if you have excess hydroxide, that should lead you to believe that this salt, when dissolved in water, will be basic. And there you go. All right, this next one here. What does it say? It says, predict the pH of a solution formed by dissolving equal parts hypochlorous acid and sodium hypochlorite. Uh, note that the uh, acid gives a K value. Uh, circle one of the pHs. Well, that's that's this is laughably simple. We did this one bef basically up above for number one when we talked about buffers. This is really a buffer, right? We've got a uh, weak acid, which I will again name HA. And then you got the sodium, sodium hypochlorite. I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to get rid of the sodium, and that is going to be my A minus, right? That's the conjugate base. We've got a weak acid and a conjugate base. That's a buffer. And so let's just take one. Since I'm given the K, I'm going to go ahead and write out uh, what I have here. I'm going to write H, uh, HA, right? That's what we said. And that's aqueous. And it's going to react with some water, right? That's important. Just like above, we've given a, a 10 to negative fifth, so it's reversible. Uh, we're going to get our conjugate base, and that is dissolved in water as well. Plus what? Well, it's an acid. It's a Ka, so we better have some hydronium. And you could sit there, and I'm just going to go ahead and work this out, right? I'm going to say that we're going to deal with some um, molar concentrations. You'll say, oh, but Dr. Porter, there are no numbers given. What do I do? Well, you know what? My favorite number is 1. So let's just throw in 1, and it's equal amounts. I'm going to make it 1 molar because I say so. And there we go. You could have picked 42. You could have picked any number you like. It doesn't matter. And so you need to make some hydronium here. So it's going to be x, 1 minus x. Man, look at that. Plus x, plus x, and then 1 plus x, and then this is x. And I'm going to write my k value to earn some extra partial credit in case I didn't know what else to do. I'm going to write that in all over my, oh, I, I should probably be more careful or these have to be the equilibrium concentrations right really important almost forgot that and that equals what that equals 1 plus x over x or times x over 1 minus x 1 is a pretty big number that's negative 5 we can probably do our approximation here 1 x over 1 easy enough equals uh, 3.0 times 10 to the negative fifth, which you already realized is the Ka. So in this case, it's pH equals pKa. And why is that? Because the hydronium concentration equals Ka. And I'll go ahead and write that down. There we go. So if we do this, I think I get something along the lines of, oh, what is this guy? This is, oh, I don't know. Um, you could crank it out if you really wanted to. I get 4.52. But even without doing this value, you could realize that uh, if you just kind of spot check the 10 to negative fifth, you can tell the pH at pKa uh, is going to be around 4.5. And so you'd say, OK, well, in this case, this is acidic. And remember that neutral is 7. Alkaline is over 7. So acidic is below 7. And this is probably a long way. Uh, you know, you're just throwing some complete sentences here. Um, you know, the idea of the fact that 
you have a buffer formed by equal amounts of the weak acid and its conjugate base. Its Ka value is 10 negative fifth, which indicates that it will be an acidic buffer. Um, you know, so you can explain it um, on your own time, but it's pretty, pretty simple here. Again, I just like to showcase the ice method one more time, um, but make sure you throw some, some explanation down as well. All right, here's a kind of a goodie from the past. Um, Dr. Weiss covered this material, and it was really important, this idea of uh, Le Chatelier, right? And so if you're thinking about um, our process and uh, you want to increase or decrease a certain uh, favorability of a product or reactant, uh, really important. And I'm going to go ahead, and since this is a K, I'm going to do two things. Uh, I'm going to write the expression for the K, and I'm going to say, okay, what is important here? Remember the solids do not factor in to the K value. So products of reactants, right? This is going to be the concentration of CO2 at equilibrium, and that's it, <laughs> right? There's nothing else here, so that's really important. However, I do like to think about the thermodynamics here. Endothermic means that what? Well, heat would be a reactant, right? That's a we talked about this in the last unit. Delta H is positive, right? That's really important. So that means heat is a, pro a reactant. Sorry, heat is a reactant. I put it in the right spot. I misspoke. I hope you get the idea. So heat is a reactant. Really important. So what are some things that we could do here? Well, you might be tempted to either add or subtract some of these magnesium species, and you'd be wrong. You'd be wrong, and you lose some points, and you'd be sad. And you don't want to be sad during spring break, so don't do that. Um, but we could do what? This guy's a gas. We could remove CO2, right? If we remove this one, it will shift, the reaction will have to shift to products to reobtain equilibrium, and that's important. What else could you do? Well, CO2 is a gas, right? You could um, increase the volume, right? And that's really important because you can think about Dr. Weiss's discussion of the effect of um, volume changes, and, and that's important, so you can think about that. You could also think about the pressure changes that relate by changing the volume, so that's important. And then finally, um, you know, a couple of different ways you can explain this. Number one, you could say heat is a reactant, so you could say raise the temperature, right? Because if you add heat, or sorry, you add energy in the form of heat, that's going to push the reaction over here, right? And that's important to reestablish equilibrium. And really, the, the, the underlying note there is that by increasing the temperature, what have you done? You've actually changed the K. And for endothermic reactions, if you increase temperature, the K actually goes up. And if the K goes up, what happens? That favors products. And that's really important. All right. Uh, number six, moving along. We're almost getting there. Almost page two done. Um, titrations, right? So here we've got a weak base being titrated. Oh, HCl, that is a strong acid, right? And we can think of that as hydronium. I just write that down. And so if we've got a weak base, and this is titrated with means that's in the burette, right? So we've got our little flask with some weak base, and we're going to dump in um, strong acid. So before we add any acid, right, so there's no acid, what determines the pH here? Well, this is nothing more than a weak base problem, right? So ammonia the weak base is what's determining our pH. And in this case, if we have a, a weak uh, base, um, that's still going to be basic. And there you go, over 7, right? Now, halfway to the equivalence point, what are you going to have? Well, you're still going to have some weak base, but you're also going to have some conjugate acid. And what do these look like? Well, you're going to have the ammonia. However, you're also going to have equal amount of an H4+, right? And that's going to be basically, sorry, no pun intended, that's going to be an alkaline or a basic buffer, which will still be above 7. Really important. However, at the equivalence point, what happens? All of that weak base now has reacted. So all you have left over is the conjugate acid, in this case, in H4+. And so you shift it down to acidic, because if the... Uh, conjugate acid is the only thing in species in solution. That's going to be the dominant species, and that's going to actually generate some hydronium, which will be an acid. And then finally, after the equivalence point, the only thing that matters is that you've got excess 
hydronium left over because you've added too much acid and that's clearly going to be acidic and so very very simple here this relates directly to the handout that you had earlier about titrations and so I hope you take a look at that okay moving right along okay we've got some salts here um, in this case we've got some salts that are not very soluble and so how do you know that well <laughs> wow you're given a KSP value, right? That is tiny, 10 to negative 12. Okay, so we call this typically an insoluble or sparingly soluble salt. So before you do any math problems, you want to go ahead and write out the chemistry involved here. So this is sodium, or sorry, silver, uh, silver uh, carbonate, right? And that's a solid. And when you write a KSP, you break this up, and and this is really important. You're going to have two silver ions right and you're gonna have a single carbonate and that's really important because they are mismatched in terms of their um, charges and so it takes two silvers to neutralize or electronically neutralize not acid base chemistry here well I guess there is a little Lewis acid base chemistry here but let's not worry about that right now you've got some um, silver plus you need two of them to form a neutral compound with the carbonate and so let's go ahead and jump in our ice setup just like we did before and again this is going to deal with molar concentrations now remember this guy's solid we don't worry about solids in the equilibrium expression and that's really important to remember so it makes our lives very easy and here we say well, we want to find out how much is soluble in di water if you if you have di water you initially have zero of both of these which means reaction is going to shift to products to reach equilibrium so we're going to go up, and I typically write um, S for molar, solu molar solubility, and this one's going to go up by S. And it's really important that you look at the stoichiometry here, 2 to 1. You get spoiled with acid bases, right? And you think 1 to 1 to 1, and that can burn you here when you deal with uh, salts that have uh, variable stoichiometry. So at the end here we have 2S and S. And so now we can write this out. I always write it out from the beginning. KSP equals the silver concentration squared, right? Because there's two uh, two mole ratio. The ratio is two to one, right? Times the carbonate, and that's a one. You don't have to write the one there. And if we plug this in, we get two s squared times s which equals what? Now remember when you do this exponent you've got to distribute it into both, right? So this becomes 4s squared times s which I typically write stepwise is 4s cubed and then that gives you your math your mathematical value here of 4.8 eh, sorry I swapped them, I do that sometimes 8.4, that's correct, times 10 to the negative 12 and the way I do it is I would divide both sides by 4 and then take the cube root. And if you do that, I think I get 1.3 times 10 to the negative 4th molar, which equals S, which is the molar solubility. Check my math just to make sure I didn't mess up there, but that's pretty simple. So that's the solubility in DI water. What is the solubility in... Um, a new solution. This is not DI water, and in fact it's actually a solution that has both silver and nitrate. And so let's go ahead and still write the KSP, right? So we're gonna have silver carbonate, right? That hasn't changed. That's a solid and it's in equilibrium, right? And we're gonna have two silver plus ions, just as we did up above. I just like to write it, write it again each time I'm using it so I know what I'm dealing with. And there we go. And you can anticipate the ice setup that's coming because we're dealing with the solubility of this sparingly soluble salt and we don't worry about the salt because it the solid because it doesn't impact into the equilibrium expression. Now here you're gonna say, okay, you might be tempted to say zero, but is there a shared ion here? We've got silver here, and we know this is a nitrate, and a nitrate is soluble. So I typically rewrite this to tell me I have 0.1 molar silver, right? Because this is a one-to-one -one salt. I also have 0.1 molar nitrate. 
in this case, the silver, that's important because that's a common ion. And so we need to write that we actually start with 0 0.100 molar. Do we have any carbonate? No, the nitrate's there, but the nitrate doesn't do anything. And so we just say that we start with zero here. So we still shift because there's zero carbonate. So that's gonna give me plus 2s plus s. And that's gonna give me 0 0.100 plus 2s and carbonate's gonna be s. And now we can write out the KSP. Again, I always like to write it out and I got lazy in the first problem, but I'm gonna go ahead and write equilibrium squared there times the concentration of carbonate, and that's at equilibrium. And if we write this out, we can say we have 0 0.100 plus 2s squared times s. And I'm gonna say that s is pretty small. And we'll figure out what s is in a minute, but I'm gonna go ahead and make the approximation that is exact, uh, approximate to 0 0.100 squared. So I'm gonna say that 2s is small compared to 0.1 and we're gonna multiply that by S, and that still equals our KSP, which is what, um, 8.4, try not to swap the numbers around this time. That's such a small number. And if you crank that out, I think I get S equaling something like 8.4 times 10 to the negative 10th ish. And if that's the case, wow, look at the difference that addition of just 0.1 molar silver nitrate reduces that solubility of silver carbonate from 10 to the negative fourth all the way down to 10 to the negative tenth if I've done my math correctly and that's that's really cool I mean common ion effect is really amazing okay and this last one right is a little bit of a flashback because it covers some of the stuff we did really early in the unit and maybe a little bit rusty for you and so uh, be really careful here because I think this one can really get you into some trouble if you're not careful and so it deals with this equilibrium between nitrogen monoxide uh, the diatomic nitrogen the diatomic oxygen so before you even do this I kinda wanna read the problem a little bit more carefully here before you jump into an ice table which is probably the first thing you're gonna do and you could do that, but you might go the wrong way. And so I'm gonna look at this and say, okay, we've got 0.2 mole, and that's important. It's not millimoles, that's moles, which means we need to think about our final volume in liters. We've got 0.7 moles nitrogen and 0.7 moles oxygen, and it's in a 100 milliliter container, which I am gonna go ahead and convert this, this one time, to 0 0.1 zero zero liters and that's really important because we need to convert these to molar concentrations and what I'm going to do first is I'm going to go ahead and kind of begin the ice table but I'm going to only do the first line and I'll show you why that is in a minute so if we have 0.1 molar of nitrogen monoxide and it's in 100 milliliters or 0.1 liters so moles per liter gives you molarity and I'm going to say that for this one we then have two 0 0.0 mole, molar, right? And then for each of these guys, we've got 0 0.7 divided by 0 0.1, which is 7.0 molar, and that other one's also 7.0 molar. Okay, now, the next step of the ice table, you'll want to figure out which way does it change. And this is where you might be really tempted to say, oh, well, it's negative x and positive x and positive x because that's a 2.3k. Well, you'd be a little bit reckless if you did that so be careful let's let's actually think about this right here and this is really important so I'm gonna look at that initial step I'm gonna bring it down here and what do you remember about calculating initial values well initially you don't calculate K you actually calculate Q it has the same algebraic form and so here we'll say this is gonna be the molar concentration of N2 and the molar concentration of O2 all over the molar concentration of NO squared, right? Don't forget the stoichiometry, that's really critical. And if we do that, just as kind of a spot check, you'll see you get 7.0, uh, 7.0, all over uh, 2.0 squared, which is four, and if you crank that out, you get something like 12.3. Hmm, well, in that case, we can compare Q which is greater than K, which means that, well, in order to reach equilibrium, it's gonna have to shift. And right now it's too product heavy, right? The products are too high in concentration. So the way to shift would be to shift to the left, 
which would be towards reactants. And that's really, really critical because if you don't realize that, you'll get the whole problem wrong. Well, actually, I'll take that back because if you did do it wrong and you put, um, you know, if you were tempted to put negative x, positive x, positive x, the math will actually kind of tell you, hey, hey, buddy, you're going the wrong direction because you'll actually get a negative value for your molarity, which tells you you went the wrong direction, which is kind of neat. Um, but let's avoid negative molarities. That's, that's not good. So in this case, we realize that we have to shift to the left to reach equilibrium, which means we will have to go plus 2x, right, because of the stoichiometry, minus x, minus x. And that's really important. So now we can actually finish this ice table. And at the equilibrium concentrations, you're going to have 2 plus 2x. Again, don't forget to carry that 2 down. And then 7 minus x and 7 minus x. Really, really critical. That problem, it looks deceptively easy, but um, if you're not thinking about what's going on, you can really uh, botch this one. And so we'll write the K expression here as equal to the diatomic nitrogen. I'm going to reinforce the idea that's at equilibrium. And the oxygen, same thing, that's at equilibrium, the last line in our ice table. And we've got the uh, nitrogen monoxide equilibrium concentration squared, right? We want to remember that stoichiometry, that 2 is really important. And so we can crank this out and we can say, okay, what do we have here? We've got 7 minus x, 7 minus x, all over, what do we got? 2 plus 2x squared. And if you think about that, doesn't that look an awful lot? Let's just factor these, combine these guys together. 7 minus x squared all over 2 plus 2x squared. And that equals uh, 2.3, which is the k value, right? Now, at first, you'll look at that and say, oh, no, it's a quadratic. What do we do? Let's cry. No, it's, it's pretty simple. If you think about that, this is a perfect square, right? You just take the square root of that whole side square root of that whole side, and what do you get? Well, it makes our life so much simpler. You get 7 minus x all over 2 plus 2x equals the square root of 2.3. And you can do that. That's not hard. That's not even a quadratic anymore. And so really simple. And I think if uh, I do my algebra, now here you'll get a little error due to rounding if you're not careful. I think I got something like 1.0 Oh, what is it? 1.0, I don't know, 17 or something like that molar. And then you just plug it back into the equilibrium concentrations. And I think I get something along the lines of uh, 4.04-ish and 5.98-ish for both of the uh, products. And so here you see, yes, they, they did decrease from 7 to around 6-ish. And this one went from 2 uh, up to around 4-ish. And if you plug it in uh, to check your work, right, because you can actually plug these equilibrium constants in to your value here, and you can actually figure out, am I uh, reasonably close to our value? And I think I get like 2.2 or something like that. And it's just due to some rounding errors in the problem. Or you know maybe I made a math mistake or something. But I'm pretty sure it's, it's pretty close to here. So your numbers are pretty pretty valid. And so um, really easy problem, but very, very uh, easy to make a mistake. So I hope uh, this helps you. I know this video was a little bit longer than I'd like, uh, but I hope it gives you some good pointers. And so um, good luck on Friday. Come ask questions if you have them. And go see the, the nice tutors in the QSC and get extra help. But please, again, make sure to eat breakfast. Make sure to get some sleep because you don't do uh, your best work when you're tired and hungry. So um, again, I know all of you can do well on this. You've been working really hard and you can master this if, if you put the time in. And so I hope you can put some points in the bank, go into mid-semester feeling good about your work, and um, I'll see you in class and um, I'm rooting for you. So do your best.